our research institute. I'm joined by uh, my colleague Liang Min from Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative as your co-host for today's uh, edition of the Digital Grid Summer Webinar Series. Uh, and we're uh, delighted to have you all here and we're excited about our panel that we have here. Our focus uh, this week is on customer DERs and wholesale markets. And uh, what we'll see here is uh, a great panel in the perspective of transmission system operators, uh, which is a, a great voice to hear in the overall discussion about a uh, digital grid. So let's go ahead and get started. First, uh, a bit of, of housekeeping. Um, everyone here is on mute, and a number of you I know have been on uh, a lot of our other series, so you're familiar with this, but for those of you for whom it's your first time, uh, the best way to participate and engage and ask questions or, or interject comments, which we'd like you to do, is via the chat feature. So if you look on the bottom of your uh, WebEx uh, panel, you'll see a cloud button there with a chat feature, and you can go ahead and uh, click that to submit questions or um, ask comments, see clarification. Uh, you can also um, select the, the Q&A function at the bottom to ask questions directly to panelists uh, or to all the panelists or to the hosts. So um, that would be uh, the second way to engage. And uh, there's also a way to select yourself to raise your hand and we can unmute you to ask a verbal question. But I think the, uh, the chat or the typed in Q&A is probably preferable. And we are recording this session, so your participation is your uh, consent to be a part of this uh, recording. And we will be posting, as we have previously, all of the presentations as well as the recordings on both the EPRI and Stanford uh, websites. And Liang will, uh, will go over that a bit further. Okay. Uh, Stanford and EPRI are both uh, delighted to be hosting this. Uh, series. Uh, EPRI, we're an independent non-for-profit organization. We do R&D across all the full spectrum of utility operations uh, from generation, transmission, delivery, and, and end use. And our objective is through our collaborative research uh, to keep electricity service safe, affordable, reliable, and environmentally responsible. And part of our mission involves working with uh, experts and uh, uh, the best out there. And uh, was, uh, we're pleased to be working in close conjunction here with the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative. As you see there, it's a major initiative focused on digital innovations of the grid for the 21st century, advancing business innovation uh, policies, and particularly technologies uh, between the customer and the grid, which is uh, exactly uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, the objectives of our summer webinar series are really to convene experts from multiple disciplines, uh, from multiple industries and multiple uh, functional areas uh, within industries to exchange views on what a shared integrated grid, uh, digital grid represents. You see there in the graphic on the right a number of elements that constitute uh, aspects of an integrated grid, a shared digital grid, and we've talked about this in uh, through some of the previous discussions that we've had. Uh, one of the key gaps that we see overall as a theme is enabling data platforms to allow uh, this seamless connectivity between customer resources and the grid. So to that end, we're seeking to understand industry requirements, uh, technological <clears throat> uh, opportunities to bridge those gaps, and to ultimately inform a research roadmap and collaborative initiative that EPRI is looking to undertake in conjunction with, um, with the industry as a whole informed by uh, these discussions. So again, uh, there are different ways of defining what an integrated grid is, but for our purposes in particular, and as a theme throughout our discussions for this webinar series, is the integration of customer resources to optimize grid flexibility. Uh, there's enormous opportunity for uh, these resources. They are proliferating, particularly in in, in some parts of, of the country and in pockets within, the, uh, within those areas, but how we can best uh, orchestrate these resources to provide grid flexibility and other needs without compromising the customer experience uh, is, is, a, is a big challenge. And particularly as we'll be talking about here, understanding the, the, the bulk operations and electricity markets perspective on how to make this happen and what the implications are. So. Uh, that's what we're talking about. I'm going to turn it over to, to Liang at this point to uh, continue with the introduction. Liang, over to you. Thank you, Omar. Appreciate it. 
So we all believe that uh, to achieve the vision of integrate digital grid, we need all the stakeholders to work together. So with the support from different sectors in June and July, we organized eight webinars and focus on different category and group of stakeholders. We have U.S. utilities, European utilities, IT companies, universities, startup companies, federal and state government agencies, corporate research centers, uh, delivered eight webinars, and all of them are recorded. The recordings are available at both APRI Technology Innovation and the Stanford Bits and Watts website. I want to give a, a kudo and a special thanks to Aurelie Wellshare and uh, uh, from Stan uh, from uh, APRI and uh, Wahila Wilkie from Stanford. They spent quite a bit of time to pull all the recording together and upload to the websites in an organized way. And really thanks both of them for the outstanding work. And starting from August, and we organized the webinars focusing on different uh, uh, technology challenges. So the last week we have the special webinar focusing on the grid resilience with customer DER integration. And uh, uh, starting from this week, today we're going to discuss customer DES integration in the wholesale market. And next week, we will have the topic discussion on the open standard data platform. And the last webinar in this month, will be discussing uh, the transactive energy, which is kind of hot, hot topic based on the polling uh, several weeks ago uh, with all the audience. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce the speakers for today's webinar. We are very glad to have uh, three independent system operator venturers from both East Coast and West Coast for today's conversation. And uh, we have uh, Jill Powers and uh, John Gooding from California Independent System Operators. And we have uh, Tong Xin Chen from ISO uh, New England. Three of them has been with ISO and the RTO uh, area for many years, and uh, I just want to have a quick introduction for each of them for their background. Joe Powers is the manager for infrastructure and the regulatory policy at California ISO. Her current focus is on the policy and the modeling development advancing DERs in the wholesale market to further enable diverse technology participation. Right now, she is responsible for the California ISO energy storage distributed energy resource is so-called DSDER policy initiative. Chang Gooding is the senior manager for KISO's infrastructure and the regulatory policy. He manages a team responsible for formulating the KISO's market design and the policies related to resource adequacy, capacity procurement, demand response, and the distributed energy resources. Previously, he was responsible for the design of KISO's current suite of demand response program and products. John is a part of the California ISO original startup team back to 1997 and has been with KISO over more than 20 years. So our panelist from East Coast, Dr. Tong Xin Zhen, is the technical director of ISO uh, New England. He managed research and development projects for the regional wholesale electricity market. As the internal IND arm for the ISO, he provides technical consultation on the market and the system operations to the executive team of ISO New England and oversees the development of a market clearing engine and the market simulation software for the ISO. With that, I'd like to have a Jill to help us kick off the conversation. Joe, I will hand this over to you. Great. Well, hello, everybody. Um, again, thank you for that introduction, uh, introduction, Liang. I wanted to start off by giving, um, in, in, the, in the panel presentation from the ISO, a little bit of information about the ISO, what's happening in California that is influencing DER development in the state and getting a lot of the ISO's attention. 
Then I was going to give some information on what the ISO has been doing to facilitate participation of DERs in the wholesale market for the provision of wholesale services. Then I'm going to uh, hand it over to John uh, to give you a glimpse of what the future might hold for DERs from a California ISO perspective based on our current experiences of market integration um, to date. So with that, a uh, little bit of information about the ISO. We are one of the nine grid operators in North America. We are a nonprofit public benefit corporation, although created by California statute, um, we are not a California agency, California state agency. We are governed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, <clears throat> we are one of 38 balancing authorities in the Western interconnection, serving over 30 million people, um, including areas within the state of California, about 80%, as well as a small portion of Nevada. I did want to mention that while we serve customers, our interaction is not directly with them. Um, our interaction is with a smaller number of ent entities uh, we call market participants. We have about 221 market participants uh, that we interact with, and they are the ones that have the, the interaction, direct interaction uh, with, with the customers that we serve. Uh, again, some of the some of the uh, some of the information about our functions of the ISO. We have uh, we use advanced technology to ba balance supply and demand every four seconds. Our operators are located in two control rooms, and we have pictures here of the one in Folsom, California. We do have a backup facility in Lincoln, California. California, and both of those control rooms are operated um, 24 hours a day, seven days uh, a week. Uh, and the, uh, we have recorded our peak demand way back in 2006 of 50,270 megawatts. Uh, we have not reached that record peak demand since then, although we did come close in 2017. The ISO operates markets for wholesale electricity and operating reserves, and those markets include uh, day ahead markets, 15 minute markets, as well as five minute real time markets. Additionally, the ISO oversees an open and transparent transmission planning process that actively engages stakeholders' input on determining short and long term infrastructure needs as well as we have a robust interconnection process for new generators streamlining their interconnection to the ISO's up, um, transmission grid. And having a little bit of difficulty advancing So the, the, what, what, is, what is happening in California is there's the pursuit of a, a aggressive pursuit of a low carbon future. And some of these goals um, have been met even to date. The 33% by 2020, um, we have goals to get to 100% uh, zero carbon by 2045. Very aggressive goals that are, are having an impact as to uh, the reliability of the grid. Additionally, deep greenhouse gas reduction goals are targeting an 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. Additionally, state incentives have been created to move the state to these greenhouse gas targets. These include, include a robust electric vehicle goal of having one and a half million EVs on the road by 2025, 12,000 megawatt procurement of distributed generation by 2020, as well as 1.3 gigawatts of battery storage on the system by 2024. While these goals have been challenging for the ISO to maintain grid reliability, 
um, with less reliance on traditional large-scale fossil fuel generation. It has um, created opportunities as the industry shifts to reliance on renewables um, for a high DER energy service industry. Uh oh, I'm doing the wrong. There we go. Okay. So in 2018, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission voted to remove barriers to part to the participation of electric storage resources in competitive electric markets, really with the goal of improving competition and enhancing system efficiencies while increasing resiliency. So this was established under the FERC Order 841, um, in which it established a storage participation model um, to, that would recognize, well, required the ISOs to establish a storage participation model to recognize physical and operational characteristics of electric storage resources and <clears throat> accommodate their participation in the wholesale market. Additionally, there was um, within the notice of, uh, within the notice, uh, uh, defining DER aggregators as a type of market participant. However, this was deferred within the order. Um, and then, and additionally, there's other uh, state uh, activities seeking to remove barriers to market participation by storage and microgrids. Um, and this is found under State Senate Bill 1339, which is, has a goal of facilitating the commercialization of microgrids through more standardized interconnection processes, uh, development of separate rates and tariffs, and just overall new standards for microgrids. And the CPUC has initiated a rulemaking um, for this State Senate Bill 1339 on microgrids. Again, um, additionally, attempting to remove barriers uh, for uh, wholesale market participation for these type of resources. I apologize, I'm just having the most difficult time <laughs> advancing the slides. And I cannot find the little button to advance. If you can hear me, Jill, I have control, yeah. so I'm advancing them for you. Oh, okay, you're advancing them, no wonder. Okay, so let's, let's move on to some of the participation models for DERs to participate in the market. Um, and as mentioned, there's been a lot going on in the state as well as the, at the federal level um, for many years. And, and so the ISO has been working over the years to develop these participation models um, for demand response, uh, energy storage, as well as distributed energy resources. So there are models within the ISO that enable dispatchable load curtailment to participate in the wholesale market. And this is called our proxy demand resource participation model. And this allows for the aggregation of multiple end use customers uh, to provide services at a, as a single demand response resource. Uh, and with a, with a, a value, a capacity value that is greater than 10, uh, 100 kilowatts. These type of resources have access to both our energy, those day ahead and real time markets, as well as our ancillary services markets. They can provide spinning and non-spinning reserve. Um, and as I, I will get into a little bit more detail about a load shift uh, product that we have developed and, and is currently uh, being implemented under the PDR participation model. Additionally, we've developed a what we term as a non-generator resource participation model that it was designed specifically for energy storage devices, uh, um, and it does allow for distributed energy resources that are ener of energy storage resources to participate in the market. And this participation model allows for the variance between 
consumption of energy as well as production of energy. It's a very sophisticated model. Um, has a lot of different parameters that are utilized in order to optimize these, these resources within the market. Um, and one of those is the state of charge optimization, as well as an understanding of these type of resources energy limits. And finally, um, we did delve into a uh, participation model and really a framework for distributed energy resources in aggregate um, to, participate in the to participate in the market. Um, we did kind of uh, develop this framework similar to what we, we developed for demand response, um, but specific to different types of uh, distributed energy resources and allowing them to uh, aggregate um, these DERs and, and DERs that were in front of or behind the retail meter. Um, it did have some limitations in terms of the provision of this type of, of resource with uh, requirements for a minimum of 500 KWs, um, uh, as well as a maximum aggregate, aggregation limit of 20 megawatts. Now, since FERC Order 841 and the compliance to for FERC Order 841, we have had to lower the minimum size requirement for energy storage participation to 100 kilowatts. But because this is uh, an aggregation uh, participation model, we've maintained the 500 kW requirement, minimum size requirement for this type of participation. Additionally, as, as mentioned, uh, DERs could participate in the markets under our non-generating resource model. Um, there, and this type, the DER provider participation model was really developed um, for aggregation of very small resources. Um, so it, it is limited to um, resources in aggregation that have sub-resources uh, with a size less than one megawatt. So really, we now have participation models um, for generation that looks that allows for the ramping between um, zero megawatts to 20 megawatts, as, as identified in this, this little graphic on the right, um, as well as we have participation loads that really look at the ramping of resources within the load area of the, the, the um, of the scale, as well as the non-generating resource that has the ability to look at uh, both the consumption and the production of energy um, with parameters uh, specifically for both those types of, of uh, services. Okay, John, we'll go to the next one. So the most recent uh, participation model the ISO has been developing is a load shift resource for behind the meter battery storage. This allows a behind the meter battery to not only discharge or curtail load, but to charge as a load consuming device during negative price intervals. This participation model is developed under our demand response participation model, our PDR model. Um, and this is how these type of resources that are definitely in the distributed, that are uh, in the distribution system and are located behind the retail meters could gain access to uh, the ISO markets and participate and provide these type of services. And with that, I will turn it over to John to continue on with some of our future outlook. All right. Well, thank you, Jill. Um, appreciate that. And good morning, everyone. Again, my name is John Gooden. Um, Jill and I have worked for many years together, um, working on all things uh, demand response and distributed energy resource related. Um, really what I want to do is uh, carry on from where Jill um, in her presentation this morning, which was kind of looking back in the past into the present um, and all of the steps and models that we've implemented over the years 
enable uh, participation from DR and DER resources and to lower the barriers to their participation. What I'd like to do is just take the next few minutes and talk about the future. And as we move and as many of the um, parts of the U.S. and North America and the world really move to a, a clean, green, decarbonized grid, how do we ensure that those grids of the future that that energy future is resilient. In other words, it can, it can take and sustain um, stress conditions. Um, it can take a hit of loss of a generator or transmission line and, and stay up and running. It's sustainable, it has longevity, is reliable, and that it's efficient, both from uh, an energy production sense and also from capital investment. So we have an efficient system, a portable system, all of those things. And so what I want to do is talk about two things that are somewhat related, but are very important as we peer into the future. And number one is this concept of we have to make this duck, this sitting duck fly. Um, we'll talk about what that means here in just a sec, but essentially we have to figure out how we can make load profiles, those net load profiles after you subtract out the contribution from the variable energy resources like wind and solar that are largely non-dispatchable, how we uh, control the grid um, once you've taken out those resources and the load that they're serving. And also I'd like to uh, talk about as my second point about if we are going to try to enable this future um, we have to think about a different grid architecture in the sense that if we're going to have a more decentralized and democratized energy system uh, where there's more local control and local resiliency through di the use of distributed energy resources, I posit that today's um, operation and how we manage the grid is not ideal and it's going to have to change. Um, again, if we're going to achieve these goals of resiliency, sustainability, and efficiency. So let's just uh, take a walk down this path briefly and talk about number one, about how we make the sitting duck fly. I think most of you are familiar with the idea of the duck curve and how we're trying to operate the systems in very challenging ways. In fact, if your system exhibits a duck curve characteristic like California's, um, I would say that that's an unhealthy grid. And uh, it is very challenging to operate the grid today. Um, we have uh, extreme ramps in the evening as the, so as the, and, and really, let me back up a second, really this, um, kind of the situation we're in today in California is really attributable to really the success we've had. An incredible amount of participation from solar and wind and distributed energy resources like behind the meter solar. I mean, it's just been incredible, uh, the penetration levels that we're seeing. But the impact of that is that we're trying to operate um, a system that exhibits this characteristic of this duck curve. And that is a real challenge because like I said, that is uh, an unhealthy grid. We have got to do everything in our powers across the industry to try to essentially create a more favorable load profile or net load profile. And we have to try to make that profile much flatter. What I like to say is it has to be less steep which means lower ramp, less deep, less of that belly of the duck, and a lower peak, uh, the head of the duck. So less deep, less deep, lower peak. That is our goal. We have to do that. And to illustrate that point, um, I'll just forward here to the next slide. Like I said, we have to leverage all these capabilities. The point that I want to make in this busy slide is this is some real world data or based on real world data is if you notice this red line uh, on this graph, that is uh, a portrayal of this duck curve. 
to where you have this morning ramp and then you immediately have to turn your dispatch or resources around and absorb all of this um, uh, solar energy in particular. Many times we have too much relative to the load we have to serve and so we are curtailing a tremendous amount of this energy. In other words, it's going to waste and that's not going to work into the future. And then in the evening, we have these extreme ramps that we have to serve up until the peak in the day, which is now not, you know, your typical 4 to 6 p.m. Now, this is much later now. The peak occurs like 7, 8 o'clock in the evening. So there's this late shift in your peak. And then you immediately turn your resources around, your dispatchable fleet around, and turn it down. This is a very inefficient way to run a grid. We have to figure out a different way to do this and to create a much flatter, more favorable profile. The way you see that is this purple dashed line. That's the goal. What we need to do is we need to store this energy or consume this energy when there's excess and discharge that energy or, cons or, uh, or um, uh, curtail that energy when there's a deficiency of energy. And what I mean is that in this morning ramp, these, this red shaded area is when we would discharge stored energy or, or curtail load or not consume load, um, which would follow us along this purple line. And then again, in the middle of the day, you'd be charging up your batteries or your vehicles um, and storing that energy and releasing that energy uh, later in the evening during that ramp, lowering that ramp lowering that peak, creating a much more sustainable, operable, uh, lower cost, uh, essentially, profile. And that's really our goal, is to do that, is to create a favorable net load curve. Now, that's a challenge. The thing we have to do is what's on this page here. We have to take actions of across the industry, and I can't emphasize that more. There's been a tremendous amount of focus on the ISOs and RTOs and everything that they can do to help manage this net load curve. But the solution is bigger, broader than that. The solution requires actions on the retail side, not just the wholesale. It requires legislative and regulatory actions as well. And this is just a flavor of some of the things, but again, the message and the point for the future to have a sustainable energy, clean energy future is shifting and shaping load. A point I want to emphasize is it's not about reducing peak demand, which has been the goal of demand response and DERs for many years, many, many years. That's traditionally how they've been used. It's how do we serve those few hours in August when the systems peak and at, at stress? How do we sure we have enough capacity to serve those hours? That's not the future. We have plenty of capacity on the system. What we need is to shift and shape all of that, uh, those resources so that we can shift and shape that load in more favorable, favorable ways to be a, a flatter net load profile. And we can do that through storage, uh, electrification and transportation, regionalization to where we can pick up the diversity benefits of a broader, uh, more diverse grid, regional coordination. And the final point I wanna make, and this is so important, is we need in this lower uh, left side of this column is we need time variant and dynamic rates in a big way. Again, we need the retail side to step up here and ensure that we can expose consumers to time variant and dynamic pricing so that we all, individually as consumers, each one of us have the opportunity to help the grid and to change our consumption patterns in ways where we can save money and have the ability to do that through price responsive um, use and exposed to rates that allow us to do that. Right now, the most extensive sort of time variant rates we have is time of use. That's the least time variant type of rate. With the 
plethora of batteries starting to be installed, electric vehicles in people's driveways, solar rooftops. We need to have rates that allow consumers to take advantage of more time variant and dynamic rates with the technologies that they have in their possession and the ability to leverage those technologies for the good of the grid. So that's the point I want to make there. Um, that was the number one point. In the future, we're going to have to figure out how to flatten that load curve and shift and shape our load, and it's going to take the whole industry, wholesale, retail, legislative regulation to make that happen. So we have to focus on that. Second point I want to make um, is getting to this point of the grid architecture. Again, if we're going to have a more democratized, decentralized, local control, I posit, like I said in the beginning of my opening remarks, that the current sort of top-down system is not going to work. Um, what I have portrayed here is this idea of essentially the soil, <laughs> which is the bottom of this tree, is sort of the transmission system, this organized network um, of transmission lines and a system that is then feeding uh, these distribution networks that tend to be radial, tendrilled, um, much more, uh, less obviously less networked. And what we're doing is we're adding many organisms to this tree, which reflect the distributed energy resources in that system. And again, the future, as many of you have seen it, is that those DERs in the distribution system are going to start feeding the transmission system. It's just not one way anymore. We all have heard this. We all understand it. It's actually happening in California. We actually have some circuits that are feeding in the opposite direction. And what that's begging is, what is that model that's going to make this system that is shown here in simplistic terms work better so that we have end-to-end -end feasibility from the very end point on the distribution system to the very top of the system at the transmission level? How do we make sure that that's feasible? And again, a top-down approach is kind of the approach that we're sort of on now to where ultimately there's this grand operator and grand centralized optimization of a system all the way down to the very last tendrils of the distribution system. Again, I posit that is infeasible and unworkable, and that is not the future. The future is bottom-up. And I'll show that here next in my last two slides. This idea of grid architecture and this concept of a layered grid interoperability model is something that um, we've worked on in the past when Lorenzo Christoph is with the ISO, uh, Jeff Taft of Pacific Northwest National Labs and Paul Martini. Um, this concept of almost like these Russian dolls. And let me explain the bottom-up approach and why it's a better approach and I think the architecture that we have to move towards is that essentially you're transacting at each of the boundaries or what I call here these red points, the points of interchange between each layer in the energy supply chain, each layer in our grid. And what's happening is that at each point of interchange, <clears throat> excuse me, is where you're transacting your overages, underages, in other words, your sales uh, and your purchases are netted at this point. The beauty of this model is that you can manage volatility at each of the tiers at each level and you can incentivize folks in each tier to manage their own volatility. Another advantage is that it doesn't require deep situational awareness and a control of like a, a grand controller, grand optimizer. Um, no, each layer is doing its own control and optimization, which reduces complexity, makes this model scalable, and allows for greater resiliency and security. Uh, a point that I'm going to make is uh, my last point and last slide is it also prevents uh, tier bypass, and I can't emphasize how important that is. So again, the point of this nested hierarchical grid architecture is that you're focused on what is the net interchange 
between each layer. I don't have to worry about what's happening in that layer. I only have to worry about what's happening at that point of interchange. This happens every day in the ISO and RTO market with our neighboring balancing area authorities. We do imports and exports every day, every hour. Do I care about what's happening up in BPA or in the Southwest in their system? No, I don't have to focus on the details in their system. I only have to focus on what's happening at our shared boundary and what's coming in or out. And it makes it very simple and you apply that same concept to the entire energy supply chain from the building, microgrid, distribution, transmission, neighboring BAAs. Finally, my last slide and a very important point about this architecture is that it avoids tier bypass in the overall energy supply chain. I think everybody that's in the DER space right now <clears throat> is wrestling with very intractable problems of primacy, this idea of incrementality, uh, what is the capacity value, value stacking, double counting, you hear all of these terms. Uh, Multi-use applications is another one. The challenge is, and again, it is intractable, is that under the grant optimization scenario, there is no answers really to these issues of primacy and incrementality. If you have a meter or a battery that's sitting behind the meter, it has a limited amount of fuel in it, so limited megawatt hours. That's represented on the left um, in this uh, rectangle. If that's the amount of fuel you have, Every supplier wants to be able to do demand management for their customer and they want to actually um, sell services and asset deferral to the distribution system and they also want to sell energy services and ancillary services to the ISO and perhaps even defer transmission as a storage as a transmission asset. It is very difficult to balance and stack these values if you have a limited amount of capacity and energy and who has first rights to that capacity and energy? Is it incremental? In other words, were you going to do that anyhow? So the you know the if you're going to do time of use and shave the peak, why should I pay you at the next tier up uh, to reduce load in those hours if you are going to do it and already had the incentive to do it under a time of use rate, for example? And so this nested hierarchical architecture avoids to your bypass by essentially in each layer, you're solving your own needs, managing your own volatility, avoiding costs such as resource adequacy, for example. You're avoiding the need to upgrade the T&D system because you're managing your loads, you're managing your volatility, you're reducing your peaks, you're managing your load at your level, and so you're avoiding a lot of these costs that we express today in explicit products. And so there has to be a way to capture that avoided cost value. Um, and again, the whole idea is that you avoid this tier bypass, which is again an intractable problem that we're facing today because we're trying to solve these problems under today's architecture. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Hopefully that made sense and uh, turn it over now to our next guest. Terrific. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Uh, now let's Great. move from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder for all the audience, you can type your questions through both chat and the Q&A features uh, down the bottom. You can see uh, two buttons here. You can type your question. Okay, uh, Tongxin, the floor is yours. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Liang, for the introduction. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. This is Tongxin Zheng from ISO New England. And uh, happy uh, to be here, and um, nice to meet you uh, over there in the virtual environment. 
so as you already heard about heard about the our negation um, from California perspective, Joe uh, Joe and John give you a pretty good uh, you know introduction on the from policy uh, market design perspective and also uh, some of their thoughts on the grid architecture. I think those are the great presentations. Uh, my background is really on market operation and um, um, and, and optimization. So I will give you some uh, uh, my thoughts on the DI integration uh, in the ISO New England system and um, and what are the future uh, directions. So. Okay, let me move on. Okay, so I put a couple of slides uh, just for people who do not know anything about uh, ISO New England. Uh, so this is uh, this is trying to tell you what is ISO New England is about. So ISO New England, same as California, ISO is a nonprofit organization. It's regulated by FERC, and uh, is under uh, and uh, and it has three primary primary responsibilities managing the uh, regional electricity markets, um, uh, perform a day-to-day -day operation of the power grid, and also uh, perform system planning for the six states of New England. Uh, in terms of market, ISO New England manage, uh, you know, primarily three type of uh, three markets. One, the energy market, and service ser service market, and for capacity market. So energy market is where is the place where people buy and sell energy, um, and in the I and sort of service market, I so procure um, uh, uh, you know ancillary sort of services such as uh, operating reserves and uh, regulation services uh, to uh, satisfy your short term reliability need for the power grade. Um, and the forward capacity market is really targeted at uh, the long term reliability. Uh, which is normally called uh, resource adequacy um, for the for the system. Once. So there are many uh, resource competing supply electricity in the New England wholesale market. We have uh, currently have 500 um, buyer size in the market. So in terms of in terms of the um, uh, value of the of the wholesale electricity market. Um, this was relatively small compared to California. Uh, in, in 2019, we have about uh, the in total uh, energy transacted, in total um, you know money transaction valued at 7.6 billion dollars, and uh, 4.1 uh, 4 uh, billion dollars of which is in the, come from the energy market. And 3.4, 3.4 billion is come, come from the capacity market. And the resource market is relatively small. It's only they only have about uh, 100 million dollars. So the figure uh, on the right shows the um, uh, the the value of the electricity market uh, in the past eight years. You can see a trend over there. You can see the uh, Energy market value is going down, and the capacity value—I mean, the, the value of capacity market goes up. All right. So here are some key facts about the uh, ISO New England grid. Uh, we have uh, seven seven point two million uh, retail electricity customers, accounting—I uh, uh, mean, the, with the total population of fourteen point eight million uh, people. And uh, the season, I mean, the old time, uh, the summer peak demand is, uh, is 28,180 megawatts, recorded on October 2nd, 2006. Um, and uh, the uh, old time winter peak demand is about 22, is 22,818 megawatts on July and January 15th, uh, 2004. The ISO New England um, system contains about over over 8,000 miles of uh, high water transmission lines, and it has 13 interconnections with its neighboring control areas. Uh, eight, uh, you can see, we have eight AC ties and one AC ties with um, uh, New York ISO, and uh, two DC ties with Hydro Quebec, and um, 
to uh, AC ties with New Brunswick. The import, I mean, the AC, the, the interconnection with uh, neighboring control area is very important. And uh, in total, uh, those uh, interconnections, uh, you know, serve about 19% of the regional energy need in uh, 2019. Uh, we have a generations and demand resources, you know, uh, used, they are used to um, uh, meet the ISO and energy need. Um, they have uh, two, 350 uh, dispatchable generators in the region. They're relatively large, uh, with a total capacity, operating capacity of 31,500 megawatts. So the figure on the right uh, shows the uh, source of the energy. Um, so you can see in 2019, you can see that the uh, natural gas uh, fire generators, uh, generator, uh, generators produce 40% uh, of the energy need for the region, and uh, new nuclear produces 25%, uh, renewables and uh, the hydros constitute, uh, produce about 16%, uh, uh, relatively low uh, in terms of uh, uh, generation output, which are the coal and oil, they're only about 2%. But looking into the future, um, there are over 20,000 megawatt of uh, proposed generation in the ISO interconnection queue, the majority of which is uh, wind uh, resources. Okay. And uh, roughly, you know, roughly 7,000 megawatt of generation have retired or will retire in the next few years. Okay, so this is out of from supply perspective. We have those kind of different type of resources. If we look at it from the, the demand side, we have 580 megawatt of active demand resources and uh, 200, uh, I mean 2,630 megawatt of energy efficiency obligations um, in the for capacity market. Okay. Okay. So the distributed energy resources are, in fact is abundant uh, in the ISO New England system. Uh, by 2000, uh, 2019, we have uh, 7,437 uh, uh, megawatts in total, uh, accounting for 19% of the operating capacity. And this figure below shows that um, the different types of uh, DERs, and you can see this, the energy efficiency, uh, solar, uh, which roof, with solar PV, which including the both non uh, participating and participating uh, resources uh, are the majority of the, our distributed, distributed energy resources. Um, there are seven, uh, 712 uh, megawatt for gas and other and, and conventional generators, uh, in the, which is a DERs, and 450 megawatts, uh, 58 megawatts of non-solar uh, generate uh, new renewables, which including hydro, you know, small hydro or wind resources, and also 214 megawatt for non-DG uh, demand resources. Okay. So those are the types of the DRs uh, in our system. If you look at uh, the participation of market, okay, uh, the DRs currently can participate in our uh, market, I'll say wholesale market through various programs. So there are list them below here. There are uh, demand response programs, uh, settlement only generator programs, and uh, energy storage. Um, so for the demand response resources, we have pa passive demand resources, which include uh, on-peak demand uh, resources and uh, seasonal on-peak demand resources. And uh, when we talk about active, I mean, pa passive demand resources, those are the resources that are only participate in our capacity market and is not presented in the, um, uh, is not actively presented in the energy market. Uh, we also have um, uh, active demand resources, which um, people can participate through the price pre responsive demand, which is called PRD uh, program. So here on the, the, the figure on the right shows the, um, the, the DR market participation. And you can see that uh, the purple piece shows that 50% of the DRs actually participated through the demand response program. 
and 22 percent of them participate into uh, through the ISOG program, and 27 uh, percent of uh, participated in, uh, actually did not participate in the market. Energy storage here, a list of a uh, program here. However, there was very little uh, participation in energy storage because we do not have a lot of uh, energy storage resource in current in our system. Uh, so in the next couple of slides, I will uh, focus on some of the programs that um, you know have a direct impact on the energy market operation. So I will briefly introduce the PRD, SOG, and um, uh, energy storage. Um, so the first uh, program is a PRD program. Uh, you can see that uh, you know the load management. Uh, um, uh, small DGs uh, and uh, so so those type of uh, pro, you know program or load reduction can actually participate into the PRD program. So they can offer capacity, energy, and uh, ancillary services to the market. Uh, they had to be they had to 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 be able to uh, participate in the market. They had to be. Uh, satisfy some uh, you know, meeting uh, meeting requirement, and also we use baseline calculation for the PRD uh, program to uh, compensate and monitor the those resources. Uh, those resources actually can participate through uh, what we call the aggregation, or as a single uh, resource that at a particular location. For a uh, aggregation, they had to be registered at a DRR zone. We call it. DRR stand for the D, uh, demand response resources. So currently we have 20 DRR zones, and um, so multiple assets within the same DRR zone can be aggregated and uh, in, into one DR uh, DRR uh, DR resource. Uh, assets across multiple, I mean across different uh, DR DRR zone cannot be aggregated into the and into a DR resources. Um, <clears throat> so for a DR resource, they have to be capable of providing 0.1 megawatt of demand reduction, uh, and there's uh, uh, and uh, there and there's no uh, single individual asset within the aggregation uh, with with a maximum interactive capa capability. Uh, greater than uh, five megawatt. This is a limitation. Is trying to um, eliminate. I would say, uh, we, you know, we eliminate uh, their significant impact on the transmission system, or eliminate the modeling accuracy, uh, inaccuracy issues over there. So a DR resource, if they are large, you can be a, at a single location. So they have to be able to provide a 0.1 megawatt of demand reduction. And the maximum interruptible capability had to be greater than 10 kilowatt. And uh, single, uh, so DR resources here, uh, in, in, in reality, it's not really a single uh, asset. It can be a multiple asset, but they had to be aggregated under uh, the same, uh, I, I would say, a single retail delivery point. So it's such that they can provide price at a single pricing node. So move on to the next uh, uh, participation model, which is called the settlement only generator. Uh, we call it ISOG. The ISOG, in fact, uh, is a basic is a uh, settlement only con settlement construct. So those generators that participate in the ISOG program are the capacity resources. They will receive capacity revenue uh, from our forward capacity market. However, they were uh, they are not explicitly considered in the real time operation, or you can see system operation or market clearing. They do not receive uh, ISO dispatch instru instructions. They basically self schedule themselves um, by their owner. Uh, but however, they receive energy revenue and they were settled at a at a designated pricing location. In terms of uh, eligibility. They had to be a resource connected uh, uh, below 115 kV and uh, had a uh, capacity less than 5 megawatt. Okay. Uh, the last one, the last participation model is energy storage. Uh, this is a program established uh, under the FERC Order 841. 
uh, determinant scarification, one or more uh, storage facility at the single point of in the connection can be uh, you know, aggregated and participate at the energy storage model. Um, and however, they had to be able to uh, inject and consume at least uh, 0.1 megawatt. Uh, they can, similar to other programs, they can provide uh, capacity, energy, and ancillary services. Uh, in the, under the current market design, they were they had to be registered at both a generator and a dispatchable demand. Okay. In uh, we have two programs, or oh, oh, can say two operating mode. One is called the binary storage facility, and the other one is a continuous storage facility. Uh, so this uh, the participant can choose to which uh, for, you know which model they can participate depends on their choices of uh, you know uh, regulation services and also uh, their operating characteristics. A uh, binary storage model is mainly designed for a large storage resource that has a, a you know, in, uh, you know, um, I'll say uh, discontinued opening range, such as you know, pump store, big pump storage unit, and the continuous storage facility is actually for a most more than likely targeted at a, a little bit small energy storage resource, such as uh, you know, energy battery systems. Uh, such that you can have very quick transition from charge to discharge. So, um, so, so the, as we discussed, uh, those are the current, uh, you know, participation model for the, our DERs in our system. As we know that DERs can bring a lot of benefit, as I am uh, I'm sure you already heard about them about them already. So they can provide. Uh, um, uh, flexibilities, um, uh, resiliencies, and few diversities. And however, they also provide a you know pose a lot of challenge to uh, to the to the system. So in terms of challenge, they can pro you can pose a distribution resource planning, transmission system planning challenges over there, uh, grid operations and uh, DR control operations. Uh, particularly uh, market operation and also some challenges in the state and federal uh, policies over there. Um, so as we talk about uh, the uh, current implementation of uh, our DR uh, participation model, uh, you can imagine that if we only have a couple of DRs in the system and they would, it's not going to pose a lot of challenge to the system operation. However, when you have a uh, lot of uh, DRs and each one participating in the market, you will uh, that can uh, that pose a lot of complexity for the system operation and also market operation. So, in my mind, uh, DRs need to be uh, aggregated uh, through a certain level of uh, you know aggregation. Um, and uh, participate in the uh, in the wholesale market. So this figure actually is a conceptual fi fi you know figure. Uh, I talk about, it's kind of a market architecture for a very short term, I would say a short term uh, implementation of DR integration. So in this figure, you can see the ISO in the, in the middle. So it's organized uh, one market, which is the wholesale market. Uh, so both generators and load and the large DERs can participate in the market directly. And individual DERs uh, are connected to the distribution system will not be allowed to participate in the ISO market directly. So they had to go, you know, be aggregated through the DRA, well, well a new concept of uh, the uh, similar to our DR um, aggregator. So you can have a DRA aggregator who represented the DERs and uh, offering um, a degree of services to the ISO system. However, there must be some coordination between the ISO and uh, DRA and also the DSO. Here, I call DSO is a the distribution system operator. That doesn't mean that the DSO will be uh, a market operator under this construct. So the DISO is uh, actually is a uh, an operator which is solely for reliability purposes for the distribution system or maybe sub transmission system. So their responsibility is going to be the monitoring of the, the of their grade, uh, not necessarily a transmission grade, their distribution grade, 
So they will monitor their grade and see and to report any limitation on the DRS uh, to the uh, DRA or maybe and and also the uh, ISO um, system. So the in the end of this construct, the ISO is a purely um, you know is a reliability uh, entity here. Yeah. So in terms of the um, DR aggregations, here are some thoughts on the DR aggregation. I would consider the DR aggregation is kind of a prosumer model. So individual DERs participate in the wholesale market through a DR aggregator. It will provide uh, you know both you know all type of products uh, which is in the wholesale market, which is available for the wholesale market, energy and services and the uh, capacity uh, product. The aggregator is solely is responsible for some meaning the bid to buy and offer to sell at, a, at the aggregation level. And, and they have to follow um, the ISO dispatch instruction and by disaggregating ISO dispatch signals for each DR. And they will also responsible for report the DR telemetry and communicate with ISOs uh, on this uh, distribution uh, limitation on the DRA output. Um, and, uh, and also we believe that no double compensation or double charge um, you know, so should should be allowed under this construct. And the TSO and DSO, uh, as I discussed in the previous slide, TSO, DSO should communicate with ISO on the operational issues and its requirement on the DRA uh, dispatch and commitment. Um, so here are, uh, there are, so the DR aggregation can be effective, you know, for the short run. Um, so here are some, I'm sorry. Yeah, it does. Okay, but but there are some challenges with the with uh, the aggregation model. Uh, first, the challenge is, is associated with the DR visibility. As you can see, that the ISO market is uh, is basically uh, is uh, at the transmission level, and each aggregator will be uh, modeled at a virtual at a virtual location and through a so distribution factors. Uh, which we show on the figure on the, on the right. So then uh, the, the ISO has no observability uh, of the distribution system. It will actually, that will create some challenge. For example, how do we, where do we map the DERs? Because the DERs act the physical DERs. Um, uh, the DERs uh, are connected to the distribution system. Uh, well, in our system, and most of the distribution system were not directly connected to the transmission system. In fact, they have to go through a sub-transmission system, which is actually is not modeled in the in the ISO market. And so that uh, uh, in that create a challenge to see where we should see uh, the impact of DRs on a transmission grade. So. Uh, and also, um, the, the challenge associated with that is also related to the configuration of sub transmission system, system and also the distribution system. So that really means even though you can determine the um, uh, the distribution factor, but there are dynamics associated with that because that's the, that depending on your operating uh, state of your of your uh, sub transmission or distribution system. So this will create a mismatch between the market model and the physical model. And this is naturally lead to um, the next challenge, which, uh, which I call dispatch efficiency and transmission congestion management. As you can see, uh, DERs uh, are the presented in the wholesale market, DRA, I, I mean. Uh, so they uh, add the controllable resources in the, in, the, in the market. So ISOs will, will start using the DRA to resolve all transmission um, issues. For example, in this case, if there are transmission congestion happened in this um, red, uh, you know, uh, right in the line showing red, so ISO will cons consider moving DR to resolve that issues based on their expectation and spread out in the distribution factors. However, this can create a couple of issues. So one is that uh, how the DRA going to respond to this. So DRA can receive the signal and then decide where the, the which DRs with that uh, should be responded to the D, uh, to the ISO's the dispatch signal. 
such uh, response may not be, I would say, such dispatch, DRAs dispatch, um, may not be consistent with what uh, ISO expectation. So they will, and in addition to that, uh, the DRAs may create uh, the, you know, DRAs in connected distribution system, their actual response may not be also consistent with the DRAs instruction. So in the end, um, so the DRAs, the total actual DR res response can, may not be able to uh, relieve transmission congestions as expected by the ISO. In addition to that, DRA connected, the DR connected in the distribution system may cause the uh, uh, congestions or maybe, I mean, voltage issues or the power quality issues in the distribution network. So, so as you can see that when testing happens and, you know, uh, so, so the ISOs and the DISOs can actually coordinate on this by maybe by some sort of manual process. Um, so, if the if there are uh, uh, we can say that if there are um, uh, you know if the hosting capacity of uh, in the distribution system is large, and such coordination may not be happen a lot. I mean, so, I mean once a couple of year and um, once a year. So that may not be an issue uh, from this type of uh, to resolve those type of uh, uh, you know to to perform this kind of uh, coordination. However, when a large number of uh, DRs uh, uh, shown in the you know in the distribution system and it create a lots of problems in the distribution system, then uh, the I'll, I'll say the current uh, architecture may not uh, work. This is uh, you know this is consistent with what John is talking about. In the future, we need some a better uh, a, a grid architecture. So in my uh, primary thought will be that in the long run, we should have kind of a, a two level of market structure here. Uh, so then uh, as shown in this figure. So on the on the on the upper level we have the, the transmission system uh, you know uh, market which is our existing uh, transmission uh, existing wholesale market and uh, DSO is now become a a market either a market participant or a market operator for uh, for um, uh, for a local energy market over here so the DSOs uh, will We'll try to resolve. We'll monitor uh, the the distribution system and um, um, and uh, monitor uh, and trying to dispatch DRAs and uh, there and also the resource connected into their in their system, trying and resolve any of the issues right raised in the distribution system through a I'll say a DLMP concept. Okay. However, the DISO will be will be coordinating with the ISO, or you can also say transact with the ISO at the TND boundary at the at the LMP. So in this type of uh, coordination, uh, will uh, ISO in the ISO market will have very clear responsibility, all clear goal in their operations. So. Um, so we will 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 not face the complexity um, you know created by the DR uh, integration. Uh, this concept looks uh, simple. I mean, but however, I think there are also challenges with this, especially from the state and very poor policy perspective. In addition to that, uh, the reliability responsibility between the ISO and uh, and the, I'll call the DSO market operator um, will have to be clearly specified. Specified. So, in uh, so in short, um, uh, you know, when, in my opinion, uh, uh, if you have uh, not so many D, you know DRs in your system, a a DR aggregation model should uh, should be considered in the future DI integration for wholesale electricity market and in a proper um, you know uh, coordination between the DRA uh, ISO and DSO should work in the short run. 
However, to fully resolve the DSO TSO coordination issue, the local energy market should be tapped in the future. Um, so, with a large number of DR participation in the wholesale market. So, with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. I'm, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Tanjin. Thank you, uh, Jill and John. We have a lot of questions and uh, a limited time, so we'll try to get to this quickly. Just to start it off, uh, maybe just going to, to everyone, maybe starting with Jill, since we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, it's, <laughs> I think a consistent theme has been uh, this need for market evolution and the, uh, the need for this role of a distribution system operator, a DSO, which we have in, in, in largely in Europe, but not really formally here in the U.S. Do you see this as uh, inevitably happening through kind of the invisible hand, or um, what kind of if, uh, uh, interventions are necessary in order to um, kind of establish this role formally um, in, in each of the areas? So just interested in some quick thoughts from each of you, maybe starting with Joe. Yeah, I, I think Thompson, he really laid out what the challenges were, and it's not, it, it's not just one agency or um, that is going to be able to uh, resolve this issue. Uh, the ISO has experienced this, these challenges in working with our uh, utility partners. Um, just even getting in uh, a single DER aggregation um, in, into util utilizing our participation model for the provision of wholesale ser services. And it really gets down to what has been laid out here as the complexity of these aggregations and the coordination that is really needed between the transmission and distribution operations. And without having these uh, formal coordination efforts, as well as the technology for the distribution com uh, companies to be able to have the visibility, as well as the um, uh, controllability of, of these DERs, um, is to ensure that they're not uh, at a ISO dispatch or a wholesale dispatch, if there's no reliability issues with them pro providing these services. Absent having all of that in place, there is real reluctance um, to even open up <laughs> the ability for these uh, type of resources to participate in the markets. Um, so it's going to be a, a larger than just a, uh, you know, the ISO and uh, working in partnership with the utilities, it's going to take a lot of regulatory effort um, to, at, at the state level, uh, to really uh, put these kind of uh, frameworks into place. Um, and really, uh, we really should be, as John has kind of laid out, looking at the long-term vision. We've tried to move forward incrementally into this, these participation models, um, but really we have to get to that long-term vision to really have the direction and roadmap as to how, what we're going to do um, to get there. Great, thank you. John, Tongshin, any thoughts on that before we move on to the next question? I think Joe covered it, thanks. Yeah, I think Joe uh, covered pretty uh, much on this. I think this, uh, you know, for me, I think this is a regulatory issue, especially, you know, if your DER is participating in the wholesale market directly, that's under the first jurisdiction. But if you want to set up a local uh, energy market, that's actually falls in the hand of the state. Um, and also, um, uh, the complexity involved in this uh, grid architecture, uh, let's say your local energy market or, or the wholesale energy market, the reliability, as I mentioned in the, during the, you know, in my presentation, is that uh, the reliability responsibility had to be clearly state, you know, spelled out. Because for the ISO, if you want to do a transaction with a, you know, for, with the DSO market, market, so if we agree with one transaction, so that means that uh, the DSO is supposed to be a balancing authority now. So this is one of the question that um, you know whether the DSO should be able to do that, and um, and what are the uh, the the. the the mechanism of uh, maintaining such uh, balancing authority status for the uh, ESO is questionable. Um, that's just another thought on this. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Liang? Uh, so I, I want to uh, – we have a lot of questions on the Q&A, but, but I really love the uh, – want to spend another maybe three minutes to, to continue this conversation regarding the DSO. The question is regard if we want to form this DSO and uh, be more specific is recent experience for the FERC A41, then the DC circuits, or the, the NARUC and the FERC and the uh, utility DR provider, the, whatever the, the fighting uh, we had, and also the settlements we have. And what is a regulatory innovation you think it should happen to uh, form whatever the DSO as Tongxin lay out, and also the Russian DAO uh, that uh, John pointed out, because from physically, that's very easy to achieve. You can have the boundary between different layers. But financially, from master perspective, the FERC A41 for the, for the storage is a very typical case. You know, the behind the meter and distribution level and the storage can participate in the wholesale market. And uh, the state uh, likely would not have opt-out uh, choices. And uh, it does uh, bypass different tiers. So what is a regulatory innovation need to happen to achieve this vision, which is a separator of the boundaries or the form of the DSO to coordinate with ISO? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at, at that one. I mean, this is uh, John Gooden. Um, John. I think the regulatory innovation has to be the ability to capture avoided cost value down at the lower tiers. Um, a big challenge we're having is that right now, the only game in town uh, to earn capacity payments is to participate in the wholesale uh, ISO RTO market, those organized markets. And so demand response and distributed energy resources, um, and as you know, all the activities that Joe presented um, and Tong Jin, that we've all done a lot of things in our markets, responsive to FERC order 719, 745, 841, all of these um, uh, regulatory uh, compacts that enable DR and DER to participate in the wholesale market. Um, and again, the goal there is to capture, um, generally it's to capture capacity value. Um, it's less about the energy rents that can be earned by participating, you know, actively in the market, particularly like with demand response. It really uh, generally doesn't want to participate and earn energy rents because that's disruptive, but it does want to capture capacity payments. And um, that model is a challenge in that um, we need resources that, uh, can participate and provide both capacity and energy and capture those values and do that without having to present themselves and integrate you know, and with all the complexity in the wholesale market. So the, the regulatory sort of hurdle or mechanism is, again, how can DR and DER capture avoided cost value? Um, to where they don't have to necessarily earn a capacity and express an explicit capacity payment out of a wholesale market, but by their actions and by reshaping uh, the load curve of that customer or in that distribution system under that DSO, that they are reducing the need for uh, peak capacity. So they're earning an RA, they're essentially avoiding an RA capacity payment. And so how do these um, entities, these DER entities, how do they get value and capture value for avoiding um, the need for RA or avoiding the need for ancillary services by lowering, uh, you know, requirements on the system through lower loads? Uh, less volatility, lower uh, ramping requirements and ramping energy needs. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges is 
how to uh, express that value uh, to these entities and these providers by allowing them to participate in their tier, within their tier, and actively avoiding some of these costs and getting compensation and value for doing that rather than trying to squeeze everything, every tiny little device into the wholesale market. And I think that's the challenge um, that we face is how to get that value as avoided cost value. Great. I'm, I'm going to jump in. Thank you. I know um, we got a lot of other questions, so we'll try to do rapid fire in the five minutes we have left. To, um, so w this is a question, I guess, open to all, if, just a quick answer if we can. Uh, what do you think would be the next R&D or technology innovation uh, to bring DERs into practical grid operations and grid market. So next big R&D or technological innovation to bring DER truly into um, op grid operations and markets. So, any quick, quick thought or on that? Rapid fire, this is John. I would say uh, DERMs and retail markets would be uh, a technology that could really help so that you could optimize the distribution systems. Again, that's a big lift, but I think it's important. Yeah. And I think just, um, this is Jill, visibility, um, real-time telemetry, being able to understand exactly the contribution of the different DERs and, and the actual DER aggregation response, I think. Thank you. Leanne, next question. Oh, you're on mute, Leanne. Back to the to the previous uh, uh, point that uh, John touched a little bit. Uh, the, the question is more toward the ISO New England uh, regarding the capacity market. And the question is about the increasing proposal to shift away from capacity market toward capacity market to enable uh, procuring the right service at the right time. Now, what's your perspective on that? Function? Yeah, um, um, maybe I'm not quite understanding your question. You're saying that there is a, a there are proposals to shift the capacity market to uh, to a shorter time period. Are you yeah, saying toward, that? Yeah, toward the capacity market to enable procuring right service at right time. Basically, there is a, a, a different like short time or different time frame uh, of the capacity market. Um, I think uh, most of the important thing here is if you look at our capacity market, is I think the time is very critically important. We have, and that's why we call the forward capacity market. The capacity market is supposed to provide a investment signal, let's say, to uh, for people to join uh, to ensure the resource adequacy. If you are talking about uh, you know having a let's say even even say we have a monthly or maybe daily capacity market, it doesn't, I would say, it would not give you a, a long-term market signal such that people will not use that information to secure their, I would say, loan or investment. Uh, they will go to the investment bank to get, uh, you know, the banks to get the loan or money on the financial uh, financial arrangement. So that's why we're thinking that, um, uh, long-term uh, capacity market can provide a better signal rather than a short term. Uh, but if you talk about different uh, locations, for example, uh, in our market, we do have this concept of, of uh, different locations. We have the different capacity zones. So that means that uh, we have a price for different zones. So different capacity um, have a different location and we have a different value. So that will give a diff, you know, the investment signal for different locations. But as you may mention that, that there might be some other um, attributes we, we did not consider. For example, some people will consider, you know, why should, should we consider any of the flexible different technology? For example, I'm having a flexible capacity or maybe a secure capacity which had, um, you know, few inventories, something like this. Uh, that's the thing we have not thought about currently uh, because we're trying to say we want to get a, uh, uh, we want to be a energy neutral in this market design. Okay, I think, but, but those are the good questions. 
Great. Uh, we Thank just you. have a, a couple a couple minutes left. Um, still have a bunch of questions to get to. Um, a couple questions related to the uh, the tiered framework that John you presented, which I thought was a great way of looking at this. So two questions. One is. Um, should the nested hierarchical grid architecture that you presented there be applied so rigidly to allow no tier bypass when services to be provided can be differentiated between wholesale and retail levels and allow for direct participation where appropriate? Uh, can you take that in, in 30 seconds? Yeah, I think you have to have a stricter tier bypass, but services can be coordinated by the operator at that point of interchange, be it the microgrid or the DSO to the ISO, um, those services can be transacted at those points. But to have an individual device uh, on its own bypass its operator in that tier, say the DSO, and without the DSO having any understanding, go and try to sell services into the ISO, that's where you get into real problems. Um, to where it becomes almost impossible to manage these resources because you get into primacy, incrementality, all of those problems that we struggle with today. Thank you. I think we're at the end. Uh, Liang, do, do you want to uh, take us home and close this out? Thank you, uh, Joe, John, and uh, Tongxin again. I really appreciate it. It's a fascinating conversation. Uh, even today, we had a, a very limited time for the Q&A. Apologize for all the audience. We have not cleaned up all the Q&As. Uh, but we are going to pass your question to the speakers and uh, uh, would encourage them to uh, either write your answer to you or, or communicate in different ways. Uh, thank you again for participating in today's webinar. And just a reminder, uh, next Wednesday, 8 a.m. Pacific time or 11 a.m. Eastern time, we're going to have the next webinar talk about open standard data platform. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.